Pop quiz. What's Bach's favorite way to end a piece? Specifically, what are the last two chords? Like most tonal music, his chorales nearly always end with the same formula, 5 or 5-7 five, to 1, the perfect authentic cadence. But that's not the interesting part. What happens before the dominant? What's the third chord from the end? Well, out of Bach's 371 chorales, one option shows up far more than anything else. Not two, not four, not one six. The clear winner is two six five, the supertonic seventh chord in first inversion. Today, we'll look at why this specific inversion is so smooth, reliable, and satisfying at cadences, and why Bach uses it more than any other predominant to end his chorales. 265 is a seventh chord built on scale degree two, containing two, four, six, and one, with the bass on its third, scale degree four. In C major, that's D minor seven over F. And in C minor, changing six to flat six gives us a D half diminished seventh over F. Now let's compare it to its triadic version, 2-6, which is a triad with a doubled third, scale degree 4. We can turn that 2-6 chord into a 2-6-5 by swapping out the doubled note for a chordal seventh, scale degree 1. Both are predominant chords, and they both usually move to root position 5. But, and this is the part textbooks rarely explain well, they move to 5 in totally different ways. 2-6 to 5 is driven by the parallel thirds in the upper voices. Those thirds leap down while the other voices move by step. It's very active and directional. But once we add in the chordal seventh, turning 2-6 into 2-6-5, everything changes. Seventh chords come with a rule. The chordal seventh must resolve down by step. So scale degree one, the seventh of this chord, must step down to scale degree seven. The bass already steps up from four to five. That limits the two remaining voices to one obvious solution, six to five, and the voice on two stays on two. Two six doesn't have the built-in obligation to resolve a seventh, but two six five does, and that obligation is what snaps all the other voices into place, giving you three steps and one common tone. It practically writes itself. Now let's hear the basic forms in C major and C minor as they show up at perfect authentic cadences, 265 to 5 to 1. Let's hear how Bach does it in chorale number 296. We approach 265 from a 1 6 chord where the tenor holds scale degree one as the other voices step up, instantly turning that held note into the chordal seventh. Then it resolves smoothly to seven on the five chord into the cadence. Let's hear just the last four chords slowly. Listen to especially how that held C becomes dissonant and then resolves. This is 265 doing exactly what it was built to do. But before we get any more elaborate, notice something subtle. We always talk about seven moving to one. The leading tone pulls home to tonic. But in cadences, we also almost always approach seven from one. That's exactly what 265 enforces. The chordal seventh must step down. So one has to be the voice that lands on seven. And this isn't unique to the 265 chord. It's a pattern that shows up in lots of progressions that approach a five chord. Many episodes ago, I covered the Phrygian half cadence, where a four six moves to five, and the only voice that could get to seven also came from one. So here's the takeaway. Anytime you're approaching five and the chord before it contains scale degree one, that's almost always the voice that should move to seven. It usually works, and sometimes it's your only option. Okay, now that we've seen how the basic form works, let's get fancier. Let's add some tension by turning five into a five seven chord by moving the upper voice on scale degree five down to four. Everything else stays the same. Pretty straightforward. 
And remember that five, eight dash seven just means we're moving from a five to a five, seven chord with one voice stepping down from the root to the seventh. Now let's see what happens when we instead add a four, three suspension to the five chord. We'll temporarily displace the chordal third scale degree seven with its fourth scale degree one. Everything else stays the same. Now we have a double whammy. The chordal seventh, scale degree one, becomes the suspended fourth above the bass when the other voices move. Resolving one down to seven fulfills two obligations at once, the chordal seventh of two, six, five, and the suspended fourth of the five chord. And we did all that just by holding scale degree one out just a bit longer. Box chorale number 228 layers both the five with the four, three suspension and the 8-7 move to create a cascade of rolling resolutions. We enter the 265 from a passing 164 chord, where the alto holds scale degree 1 while the other voices move, becoming the chordal 7th. It continues holding, becoming a suspended 4th before it steps down to 7, fulfilling both expectations. Then, a 16th note later, the tenor executes the 8-7 motion turning five into five seven before all of the voices finally arrive on the final one chord with a Picardy third. Let's listen to just the highlighted chords again very slowly so we can hear each staggered change. This is 265 to 5 at its most elegant, all of the tensions resolving in waves. Finally, let's insert a cadential 164 in between the 265 and the 5 chord. This looks just like the version with the 4 3 suspension with one change to the soprano melody. We'll slip in a scale degree 3 in between the two twos. Everything else stays the same. This is used to harmonize melodies that end 3-2-1 instead of 2-2-1. Two, two, in chorale 289, Bach enters 2-6-5 from a root position 1 chord, again holding scale degree 1 as everything else moves. That same note becomes the dissonant 4th above the bass in the 1-6-4 before resolving to the 5 chord and finishing out the cadence. And with our soprano ending 3-2-1, the cadential 6-4 is what makes this all happen. Again, same underlying voice leading, just a different surface decoration. So as I was collecting examples for this episode, I noticed just how often Bach uses 265 at final cadences, enough that I finally decided to count them all. Out of 371 chorales, 136 of them end with some variety of a 265 chord as the third to last harmony. That's more than one out of every three chorales. Why did he use it so much more than the other predominant options? Well, most of Bach's chorales start with a pre-existing church melody with a typical ending of 2 to 1. And sure, you could just put a 5 under the 2 and a 1 under the 1 and call it a day. But there's a more elegant option. Put two chords under a sustained 2. First a predominant that contains 2, then 5. Any version of the 2 chord can technically work there. But 265 is special because it gives you that added 7th chord dissonance and it sets up beautiful contrary motion of the bass against the upper voices, all under a melody that stays on two. A root position 2-7 would require more leaps, and a 2-4-3 ruins the contrary motion of the bass against the upper voices. Nothing's wrong with those options, they're just not as common at final cadences. But here's the cool thing, each inversion of 2-7 has its own personality, and composers use them for different reasons. We'll look at them one at a time. So if you want to hear how the other inversions solve other musical problems, make sure you're subscribed, and I'll see you next time on Dr. Fromm's Music Lab.